And I want to start right with the data set we've worked with a bit, the Cameron data. So there you have the gene activity of 6,000 genes approximately. Um, it's from yeast, and what you do for each gene, you measure the mRNA concentration. And here's just a single scatter plot you see, where you see the, con uh, the activity of gene YML128C against YFR053C. A second example is YPL um, against YMR, and one interesting question to ask is what happens, for example, if one of these genes gets knocked on? So you can delete the gene and reduce the mRNA essentially to zero values. And it's measured on a log scale. So it would mean you really drag the activity of that gene far to the left-hand side. And the interesting thing is if you do that to the gene on the x-axis, what happens to the gene on the y-axis? Both of these have a strong positive correlation, so you would tend to think, well, if I drag down the gene on the x-axis, the one on the y-axis is going to come down as well. But to answer that, really, you need a causal framework, because if you just in a purely predictive sense, you cannot actually answer that question, because you're working with a different distribution if you actively start to change and intervene on that distribution. And the nice thing about the data set is actually there are some experiments done. So if we made a prediction for the example I showed first, then actually they, um, you can find an intervention where exactly YML got not knocked out. It's marked here with an arrow. And so you can check exactly what happened to the mRNA concentration of YFR if you knock out the gene YML. And in this case, you would say, well, you've changed the activity of YML to really low values, but the activity of YFR hasn't changed at all. So it's still somewhere in the middle. So you would say that intervention, it didn't have a strong effect on the activity of YFR. The other example is um, the opposite. So here you, you intervened on YPL, and this is the intervention point again. And what you see now, actually, the activity of YMR, so the gene on the y-axis, has really been brought down a lot. So you would say that intervention has been successful to a certain extent because intervening on YPL really changed the activity of YMR to be way outside its usual range. And the question is, could we have predicted that on the left the intervention is not going to be successful and on the right it is going to be successful? This is somehow the basic motivation here. Another example is from my favorite news outlet, um, the article about impact of car color on accident rates. So if you drive a black car, watch the state of the vehicle, makes it more likely you'll be involved in an accident. And then um, it's a bit hard to, to read, but they said 47% more crashes happen if you are in a black car compared to a white car. And the reason given is really uh, that with the wrong color, you don't stand out against the background. So they, they say black, gray, silver, red, and blue fail to stand out against the background, which should raise some alarm flags already because for black, that's probably an okay argument to make, but for red, maybe a bit less so. And I checked kind of the data source there, and the 47% seems wildly exaggerated. So the study reference shows that the relative risk of black, for example, is 10% higher against white. So that's still um, significant. And the cause of question is really, if everybody painted the car white, would we have fewer accidents? Or if the insurance really offered an incentive to take a white car because you pay less insurance, would fewer accidents happen or would the insurance be sitting on a loss in the end because everybody's driving a white car but you still have exactly the same amount of accidents in the end? And of course that's a causal question here again just as in the gene expression example. Okay, so there are some different frameworks. The two major ones I briefly want to show. Apologies to the experts. Um, but I also want to say in advance, it doesn't really matter which one of those we use. So the ideas should work in both of them, even though it's a bit easier to express the ideas in the second framework. Um, 
complex, we wouldn't have to rely on that. The first one is a potential outcome model. So here, it makes most sense if you think about it, you have one binary action you can take. So you can either not do anything or you take an action. So you, you leave the gene activities as they are or you knock down the gene. Or you leave the cars as they are or you paint your cars white. Or you don't take a medicine or you take a medicine. And under both of these, you presume you have an outcome. And one is the outcome you would get if you take the action. So you paint your car white, knock down the gene, take an aspirin. The other one is the control, which is what you get if you don't do anything. And then it's really a missing value problem in a sense, because the, the fundamental difficulty is, of course, out of these two, you can only observe one. You can never observe both, because you can only do one of these two. And so if you try to infer something about the joint distribution of these two, it wouldn't work because you can, not, uh, so you can never observe them at, at the same time. But what you can do is make inference about something like the average causal effects or the expected difference in treatment versus control, but not on an individual level. And Neyman started with that, and Ruben um, is probably the main author associated with that framework. So I want to talk a bit more about the structural equation model framework where you have some variables which you arrange in a graph. And it's a directed graph. It's usually assumed to be acyclic. And for each variable, you can just write down the equation in the sense that, for example, for the variable y, which I picked out here, you can write it as a function of its parents and some noise. And you can do that for each variable in the graph. And the parents of the variable are just the, the nodes, in a sense, pointing directly towards that variable. And in the beginning, if you do that, you might think, well, why all the fuss writing it down like that? And for example, you might get a multivariate normal distribution or some other distribution in the end. Why not just write down the distribution? And so the difficulty seems to be that actually many structural equation models generate exactly the same observational distribution. For example, you could think there's the SEM where Pascal <coughs> is really the parent of accidents, so this is in a sense the causal parent for the accidents. And if you change anything on Pascal, the accidents would change as well. Or it might be the driver character that, for example, if you like fast cars, you tend to pick a red car because these are maybe the red fast cars, and so the red cars on average have faster drivers in them. And the observation dif distribution between car color and accidents would be exactly the same. Or, I mean, here's an example in a continuous case where you have three structural equation models, and if you just look at the distribution of x1 and y, they all generate exactly the same observational distribution, whether x1 is a parent of y or it's flipped around, so y is a parent of x1. Or you have yet another variable, x2, which is actually a parent of both x1 and y. In all cases, the, the observation distribution between x1 and y is exactly the same. So they all seem to be doing exactly the same thing. And then the question is, why do we have different models if you do the same thing? And the reason is, uh, of course, that you can do, do more than just observational data with them. So they, an SEM specifies infinitely many distributions. Namely, it tells you as well what's going to happen if I intervene on a variable. For example, you can say an intervention on x1 are picked out. You can model as just replacing the equation you have for x1 with a different equation. For example, you can say, well, I leave exactly the same thing in place, but then I add some additional noise in the end. So I just add some perturbation in the end. Or you can say, well, I just set x1 to 5. So I, I assume I can really fine tune the variable and just set it fixed to a value of 5, which would be called a do intervention. Or you can think of any other mechanism which would replace the structural equation for x1. And if you do that, you get a new distribution over all the variables. So here's a, a picture of the same SAMs where the hammer is kind of the intervention. So here we assume we make a noise intervention on x1. You just add a bit of noise. And these are the same SAMs as before, and what you see is 
Now, the distribution under these interventions is actually not the same any longer across these three. Um, so you see, if you add noise to x1 and xy is really the parent of y, then the correlation between x1 and y is still exactly the same as it was before. So I can compare to the observations before and you see the, the relationship with x1 and y is not breaking down in the sense that the conditional distribution of y given x1 is still exactly the same. Whereas if y is really the parent of x1 and I add noise to x1, I'm just gonna wash out x1 and the correlation between x1 and y is gonna break down. So you see there's a, a shift here and there. And so these different SEMs really specify different distributions if you allow for interventions. Okay, yet a more multivariate example. Uh, suppose you have three variables and the target variable y of interest. Then the blue are again observational data from that, from that model. And here the red R again is the multivariate distribution if you add noise to X1, X2, and X3. And they look pretty similar. The scale has changed a bit, but the relationships are really not so different. And the question is now, if you had both of these distributions and you wouldn't know that the graph is actually of this form, can you, can you find out what are the parents of Y? And the first idea you can have is, well, I just pool the data. I don't care kind of where they came from. Um, I pull the parent. Uh, I pull the data, and then I want to find R, uh, which are really the parents of Y. So all I have is that distribution, and I want to find out what is the common parent of Y. And for example, you could run a linear regression, maybe as a so naive thing to do. So here you just use in R L M. And then you find out that actually all three variables are significant in a regression sense. Of course, there's no causal interpretation here, so this is kind of the wrong thing to do. But if you were to do that, you, you find out that all three variables are highly significant for predicting why. Um, and our point is more if you have these different data which are observed under different environments, for example, observational, interventional, or intervention under one intervention type and intervention under a different type, then we can keep them separate. And I just want to show you the output of the software kind of we have as a R package in this example. And the way you, you supply exactly the same X and Ys for the linear model, but you supply as well a vector, which in this case consists of a long list of ones and then twos where the ones corresponds to the observations of the observational type and to the distributions of the intervention type. You can also call them A and B. You can also have more than just two environments. But you have to say, did that sample come from distribution A or distribution B? And if you do that, in this case, you find that the method we're going to show is actually identifying the third variable as highly significant in the causal sense. So this is exactly the parent, the true parent in that graph. And you get confidence intervals as well. Um, yeah, so, so here you get a, an output with the causal interpretation. And the main goal of the, the talk is somehow to show how to do that. For the Cameron data, the scatter plots I showed you in the beginning were, again, these were just pooled data, so I pooled across different environments. And we, again, don't use those pooled observations, but instead um, what we do is use that the data actually come again from two different distributions. I mean, you had some purely observational data in there, which are marked blue. And some data points came from a distribution where some genes somewhere were knocked out. So you knocked out a few genes. Um, they have off-target effects and so on, so it's a bit messy, but the main point is you've changed the distribution by knocking out a few genes. And we just use the knowledge, is it from distribution blue or distribution red? We don't require knowledge what exactly so you could have done a lot of, of um, so different things here. And our point is that 
even from this simple scatter plot, you can exclude one thing. This will be one of the conclusions in the sense that even from that scatter plot, you can exclude that the gene YML is actually the only parent of YFR. It could still be an element of a, a larger parental set, but you can see it already here because they, the point will be that the conditional distribution of Y given X is really changing here. So you have a much broader variance if you condition on X in the red points than in the blue points, whereas you don't see that here. So if you condition on X, you see exactly the same variance. So you cannot really reject something saying the conditional distribution of Y given X is different here, but you can reject that here. And this will be kind of the main um, idea. And this is also the plausible explanation why actually in the first case the intervention failed in the sense that uh, the intervention didn't have any effect on the gene on the y-axis, but it was successful in the second example. And where does this conditional invariance come from? It's easy to see if you write down the structural equation model, where for observational data you have exactly the structural equation model specified in the beginning because you haven't changed anything. For the intervention data, the, the assumption you have to make is that you did not intervene on Y, but you can intervene on all the other 6,100 genes in some unspecified way. And if you do that, you know the distribution of X1 to XP, however many, many variables you had, is changed to something. You don't know what that is necessarily, but you know that the distribution of Y, given the parents, is still exactly the same. Uh, which means that if you if you knew the right set of parents, so if you knew knew the parents of Y, and you condition on that, then the conditional distribution of Y given the parents is actually staying exactly the same, no matter whether you have observational data or intervention data, and you can do anything you like to the other variables. That invariance for the true causal set S star of variables you have is not going to go away. So you know if you had the right set of parents you would see that. And this has been known, of course, that if you have the right causal variables, then you have this invariance. Now the idea is somehow to turn this around and to um, translate that into, I think I skipped that, um, translate it into a data analysis tool where you say, instead of going the way where you say, if I have the causal model, I know I have an invariant distribution, I turn it around and say, I look for all invariant conditional distributions and I'm using that to find the causal model and also get confidence statements for the causal models. And you really need data from multiple en environments. If you just have observation data, of course, this idea is not gonna work because you have to check for invariance across different environments. If you just have a single one, actually you'll find you cannot do anything, which partially is also based on the fact that we don't make a faithfulness assumption in this case, and you don't have to search over a whole, whole uh, so deck space. And the positive thing is somehow you get confidence intervals out for your causal coefficients. Good, also from my side, uh, good afternoon. I'm extremely happy and thankful to be here. So in the first part, we have heard a lot about uh, the goal of the method um, and hopefully gained a bit of an intuition. And uh, in the second part, we would like to provide a few more details about what the algorithm is actually doing and what theory it's based on. And in order to do so, I sort of repeat this uh, main assumption that we have seen before. Uh, so again, you can think of the set S star as being the, the parents of Y. And so this is what Nikolai called the conditional invariance. So now we assume that for all environments, um, we don't care too much about the distribution of the axis, but this is the critical thing here. So we assume that the conditional distribution of Y given this set X S star, that this is invariant. It's always the same distribution. So the first thing that we would like to do is we, we would like to go to a linear setting. And, and how do we do this? Um, so the first line we can keep the same, but now sort of in the rest of the talk, we would like to assume that the way the Y depend on X S star is, is linear. And so this is one way of formalizing this. So we uh, say that there exists a vector of coefficient gamma star with the support S star, such that Y is a linear function of the X S star, but it's always the same thing. So here's really where the invariance comes into play. So 
the vector of coefficients gamma star here doesn't depend on the environment, it's always the same linear function. And also what you see is that the noise distribution, this epsilon, what we denote by epsilon e, um, the distribution of this noise is also the, always the same no matter which environment you are in. So this is the, the main assumption that we are, um, we are working with and as uh, Nikolai already said, in structural equation models, for example, as long as you don't intervene on y, this is also satisfied. So now this is just a uh, notation, if you like. So we say that the set S star satisfies invariant prediction, or we just say that uh, the null hypothesis H naught S star is true. Okay, this is, if you like, this is just, just the name. So not to f in order to not to forget the big picture, so in practice, of course, we don't have this set S star, and this is sort of our goal. We would like to find uh, the set S star, and what can we use? We are given data from different environments, and we somehow want to exploit this. So now, what's the main idea of our method? So somehow, it's, it's quite trivial. So what we are going to do is uh, the following. So we are going through some candidate sets S and always check whether this hypothesis is satisfied or not. So this is the main idea. So we check this null hypothesis for several candidate sets S. So I'm not going into details of what kind of tests uh, we are using. There are uh, several options, and I don't think we claim that there's a, a truly optimal one. There are several ideas that you can exploit, but I skip over the details here. Let's just say for now that we are given a test that can, given some data, check whether this uh, null hypothesis holds or not. And so how does it look in practice? So um, for any candidate set S, we always get either that the null hypothesis is rejected or not rejected. A and now the sort of the first question is, okay, but what happens? So hopefully it's not rejected for the true set S star, but what happens if it's accepted for a lot of different sets S? And now comes sort of the, m the most important formula, I guess, from my side. Uh, so <coughs> here we are saying what we are doing. So you go through all the sets that are not rejected and you take the intersection. Okay, so this is really what the algorithm outputs. We call this S hat of E. Okay, so you, you check for all sets S whether the null hypothesis is rejected or not, and then you take the intersection. Okay, here's an example. So imagine, of course this list should be longer, that you go through all possible sets and you always check is this null hypothesis satisfied or not, and you get yes, no, yes, no, yes. And then what do you do? You take the intersection of all the yes answers. So here you just look for the variables that appear in all accepted sets, and in this case it's only the variable three. So as a side remark, one of those sets will be the correct set S star, but of course we don't know which one, right? So here, let's say this is the correct one. And now there's some, uh, I would say, feature of the method that is quite trivial to see, but that I think uh, is a quite nice thing to have. So we know that with a, if we have a test with a large probability, this set S star will be accepted. So now what happens? The output, the S set, takes the intersection over all the accepted sets. But if S star is one of those, all what can happen is that the set S hat becomes only smaller. And what this leads to is the following statement. So with a large probability, the estimate, our S hat, will be a subset of the true set S star. And this is, in a, in a way, it's trivial math, but this is a very nice thing to have. Why? Because in some situations, our method will output nothing, an empty set, and we will see some of these examples later. But whenever the method outputs something, according to this statement, we can be quite confident that these are correct answers. So this is the, if you like, a, a coverage statement that you get almost in a, in a trivial way. So why, why did I write everything here on the right-hand side? So the point is that this is sort of the data version. So this is what you do when you have finite data, and this is also what happens in the algorithm. So now what you can also do is you can ask what is the corresponding uh, sort of site if you are given infinite data, so if you have complete knowledge about the distribution. And this is now uh, depicted on the left-hand side. It's basically the same thing. So now we have like an infinite data regime, if you like. We have complete knowledge about P. And now the null hypothesis don't get rejected or not rejected, they're just correct or false, right? It's a question, you can just see this, read this off from the distribution. You can do the same thing. You can check, like take the intersection of all the sets that satisfy this null hypothesis, and this is what we call S of E. 
And what kind of object is this? So maybe an intuition why we think this is an interesting object to look at. The main goal was to find this set S star, right? But in some situation, and this may now depend on the environments, this set S star is sort of hopeless to get. So you can even show that it's impossible to find the S star. So now what happens is that this we sometimes also call identifiable causal variables. So this is something that you can, given like perfect knowledge of the P, of the uh, distribution, this is what you can try to identify. And in this sense, this is where the notation comes from. So this is an, a finite sample estimate of this S of E. And we also have a corresponding statement here. So we know this is a fact. The S of E is always a subset of S star. You don't need the probability anymore. Okay, so why all the fuss about the, the sort of infinite data world? Um, we now would like to investigate what happens, um, sort of this depends on the environments, but can we make statements about when there's an equality here, for example? And this is, at least for us, it was easier to study this on the left-hand side than on the right-hand side because we don't have to care about the finite data issues. Okay, so... This is the, the theorem, uh, sort of this is what we have seen before. So the first point is um, what we tried to say is we are not making any mistakes. Okay, so this is again the infinite data world. So here uh, the identifiable causal variables are always a subset of S star and this holds with a large probability also for, no, for the finite sample regime. So the next statement um, is about seeing more environment helps. So th this is maybe a bit funny because we always try to or often try to find data that is very clean and has produced in the same way, but for causal inference, sort of, it's, uh, it's slightly different. So whenever you see more environments, this set of identifiable causal predictors grows. It increases in size. And maybe this is intuitive because if you have very, only very few environments, what we, the, we get the identifiability from a stability idea, right? And if you have only very few environments, sort of everything looks very stable. But if you get more and more environments, this, this uh, condition of being stable becomes harder to satisfy. Okay, so and the last point, um, this is, I, I'm not going into details here, so this is maybe a bit more involved, but you can also ask now for sufficient conditions such that you identify the full set of causal parents. And these conditions, we just uh, say they exist, and you can think of like that this is a condition uh, on the kind of environments on, and also on the number. So maybe as a take home message, so the identifiability improves if you have more and also stronger interventions and also as you can imagine maybe at, at better places. So some interventions may be very informative for the causal structures and some, some may be less informative. So in general, more, the more heterogeneous your data is, the better. This is maybe a bit a counterintuitive uh, take home message here. Okay, so how does this uh, look in practice? So this is a picture that's very similar to one that you have seen before. So uh, we have our target variable y, and we have four possible predictors, x1, x2, x3, and four, x4. And now um, I just chose a different representation. I don't do, uh, draw hammers anymore, but I now have this node, this environment uh, variable e. And you can think of this meaning that in the second environment, there's a hammer on x2. So in the first environment, this may be an observational setting, and in the second environment, we intervene on x2. And now what happens? So here, y is a function of x2 and x4, right? So this is the set that we would like to identify, and now we are running our ICP methods. And so here, we listed the um, accepted sets. So these are all sets of variables that satisfy the invariant prediction. And then what does the method do? It just takes the intersection of those sets, right? And in, in this example, you see that um, the variables two and four are exactly the variables that appear in all those sets. So this is what the method outputs. And if you forget about the p-value for a second, so just think of the method as being run at a fixed alpha, these are exactly the variables that are output, x2 and x4. So most of the things that I said rest on this assumption of this invariant prediction assumption that I said earlier. And now I would like to spend uh, uh, two or three, three minutes of discussing what happens if this assumption is violated. So the first violation you see here, so there um, the linearity is violated. So now y is a nonlinear function of x2. And we can do the same thing, but now it's clearly a model misspecification, so we don't have any guarantees anymore. So what happens? 
Now, if you run ICP, the output is the empty set, and it gives a comment that all models are rejected. And in a way, this is, um, this is bad news, but not super bad news. Why not? Uh, so first of all, why intuitively do we get this result? So somehow you can think of that we are trying to screen off the effect from the environment on our target Y. And we are trying to do this in a linear way. But now this relationship is non-linear due to this non-linearity here. So we are not able to do this anymore. And this is why we don't find this n-variant prediction for any set. So this is why all the models get rejected. And the good news is that we don't lose um, coverage here. This is, and this is usually the case. So if you have a model misspecification in terms of non-linearity, this leads to a loss of power, but not of, not of coverage. Okay, so a very similar story if uh, you intervene on the target variable, uh, basically the same idea. So again, this usually leads to a loss of power and not coverage. Maybe one last model misspecification. Um, this is slightly bit more involved. So what happens if uh, we also have hidden variables? And this is the, uh, the last example I would like to show here. So what does it mean? So again, y is a function of x2 and x4, but this time um, we assume that x4 is not observed. So this is a hidden variable. So again, our theory sort of makes the assumption of um, no, no existence of hidden variables. Uh, but we can still try to analyze what happens here. So we are running our ICP method, but without X4, because this is hidden. And what you see is, uh, in this particular example, so you, you find a few accepted sets, so these are the fours, uh, four sets, and you take the intersection, and what comes out is just the variable number one. So you might think, well, this is not what we were hoping for, right? So the causal parents are X2 and X4, and X1 is not a causal parent. So in a way, it seems to be a mistake. And indeed, there's a mistake, but I would say that not all hope is lost because what happens is that X1 is not a causal parent of Y, but it's an ancestor. So it, it comes in a causal order, it comes before Y. And this is sort of uh, the statement here. So th the coverage still holds if we consider ancestors instead of parents. And this doesn't only happen in this example, but this is, uh, holds more generally. So there's a, there's a theorem about this. Uh, so I, I think I, I I don't have to go into the details here. But the point is, so um, from our point of view, you can always make assumptions about this sort of the causal structure, but it's super important if you want to make this work on real data to analyze what happens if these assumptions are violated. Okay, that's from my side. Now, <laughs> um, so I'd like to illustrate a bit what can this, um, <laughs> this invariant causal prediction how can this be used for analyzing gene perturbation experiments? And think about, we have measurements of expressions, of gene expressions in yeast for the whole genome. This comprises a bit, a bit more than 6,000 genes. And to put that in the framework which Nikolai and Jonas pointed out is, we do it as follows. We have a response variable of interest here, Y, which is the expression of the first gene, and then all other Covariates, the X's, which Nikolai and Jonas pointed out, would be the expressions from all other genes. And then we would like to infer the causal effects of these X's on this Y. And then we go to the multivariate version, we could look at what is, if we have the Y, the expression of the second gene, the covariates X are the expressions of all other genes, and we would again ask the question, can we infer the causal effects of these X on this Y, and so on and so forth. And so, at the end, we, what we would like to do is to predict the effects of unseen new single gene manipulation, single gene deletions on all other genes, or in other words, we want to predict what would happen if I do a single gene manipulation, a single gene intervention. So we have collaborators on that kind of problem. This is uh, the lab of Frank Holstege, and Patrick Cameron is one of the main scientists there. This is data from very modern technology and it's actually very clean data for that sort of application. And to give you a bit more details about the data, what we have is 160 observational sample points from wild type G, uh, yeast. So this is unmanipulated yeast, just the one which grows wild type. And then we have 1,479 interventional samples. So here, uh, one gene has been manipulated and all others remain the same. One gene has been deleted, and we don't see repeated measurements of these intervention experiments. So we just delete one gene once 
and we measure. And the goal again is to predict the effects of new unseen gene deletions, the ones which have not been made. That's the goal of what we want to achieve. So this is a very ambitious and difficult problem. It's an important problem in computational biology. And let's see what the method is doing. So we do exactly what Jonas and Nikolai explained. We take linear structural equation models, the expression of each gene. I have 6,170 of those, appears once as a response variable, and the goal is to find the causal parents for each of these responses. So the method, we use this invariant causal prediction, and now how about these environmental settings, these environmental conditions? We just create two environmental settings. One is with the observational data. This has 160 sample points. And the other environmental setting is pooling all the interventional data together into one other environmental setting. That's what we use. This is a very high dimensional problem, so we perform so, some sort of lasso pre-screening. We run a lasso regression of y versus x. That selects some x variables. And then we subsequently use the selected variables in this invariant uh, causal prediction method. We do a training test data splitting. So training data is all observational and two-thirds of the interventional data. We put one-third of the interventional data aside, and we want to predict that one-third. We repeat this over the three blocks. We have a multiplicity correction, which we have to do, because we look at the 6,170 uh, response variables all together. So we do a Bonferroni type correction, and this is the result. So what we find is we get eight genes, eight variables, which are significant at the 0.05 level. That means each of these eight genes causes one other gene. And if you think about this, this is really not very many findings. We only find eight which causes one other, eight cause-effect pairs. The total number of possible cause-effect pairs would be this, which is much, much larger. So this is maybe a very conservative finding, but Remember, we use a very stringent criterion, Bonferroni correction for family-wise error rate. This is a stringent criterion. And as Jonas and Nikolai pointed out, this invariant causal prediction method might be quite conservative. The beauty of that is we can actually validate. So because we put one-third of the interventional data aside, we know, modulo some sort of noise, what actually the true ground truth is. And I'm skipping the details due to time constraints, but because we put the interventional data a third aside, we can try to validate the methods. So let's do that. If you look at the invariant causal prediction method, I find eight significant cause-effect pairs, and six of them are actually true positives. And if I look at competitors, like this is 3D interventional equivalent search, this is PC algorithm, this is marginal correlation only, then they don't have significant statements. I take the top eight scoring gene effect pairs and I validate and I find PO2, 2, and 2. And so in this example, this ICP actually has most power. And at the same time, due to this methodology and theory, we also have a control against false positive selections. OK, this is kind of another view of looking at how many true positives do we find. This is an ROC type plot. So here on the x-axis, you see the number of intervention predictions which you do. On the y-axis, the number of true positives, the true intervention effect. And this is the ICP method in red. This has the steepest curve. This is a version of ICP which uh, takes hidden variables into account. And these are the more classical techniques which are based on observational data only, like greedy equivalent search, like PC algorithm. And the gray bars here, they shade actually random guessing. Robustness, you can ask, well, I mean, this is a very difficult problem, but Jonas pointed out, even if the model is not true, even if you have model violations, we have a certain amount of robustness. If the model would exist, exhibit nonlinearities, there is, we expect a loss of power, maybe we're very conservative, but we still have uh, control against false positives. If we have hidden variables, this is what Jonas also pointed out, like this graph here, I would actually maybe find this variable x1, which is not a causal variable. Still, in my application, x1 is an interesting variable. It's the ancestors of y, so this x1 still has a total causal effect on my y. So if I do a gene manipulation on x1, it would still show an effect on y. So that's not too bad in that sort of application. 
Outlook and conclusions. So open issues, we of course could also look at nonlinear structural equation models. And then we would have to do nonlinear estimation. That makes the statistical part a bit more difficult. The conceptual part remains the same. Computationally tractable methods for exploiting hidden variable structures. We have robustness with hidden variables, but we of course could also try to exploit hidden variables to get something more powerful. That's uh, an open issue. We could also ask, can we actually learn these experimental settings? In this example, we just pooled all the interventional data together. This was very rough. Maybe we can do something more clever. This is still an open issue. What we did address is we exploited invariants to come up with, with a procedure which leads to confidence statements. So we think this is nice. This is useful. And what we should also point out is it is crucial to have observational and interventional data. So this is a different and certainly an easier setting than trying to do causal inference from observational data alone. Thank you very much. Hi. Right. That wasn't quite what I expected, having read the paper three times. Um, the authors have produced a stimulating paper, which will be of interest not only to statisticians, but people from other communities, um, such as artificial intelligence. Um, although I have been introduced as a lecturer in statistics, I consider myself a mathematician, and my particular area is artificial intelligence. So, one of the things I was particularly interested in was that the authors note that if they can identify all the causal predictors, I use their terminology from the paper. I notice that they call them parents, which is what I would have done in their talk, of a response variable. Then the distribution of this variable conditioned on these predictors will be invariant under manipulation of other variables in the system, which, of course, could be thought of as a direct consequence of the directed local Markov property. They then look for such invariants across different environments in order to um, identify these predictors. You all know all this because I've just told you. One. Nope. The authors have shown that the set of causal predictors is identifiable when manipulations of the system of certain types. This is theorem two. And they mentioned three types. Rudimentary do interventions from Perl and various sorts of noise interventions. But in the paper, they also make the assumption that the exact nature of the interventions is unknown. And if this is the case, how probable is it that the interventions are of the types discussed in Theorem 2? And I think it's not likely at all, myself. I shouldn't have said that, really, should I? An urgent task, therefore, to demonstrate that the set of predictors is identifiable from a much wider class of interventions because... This is a brilliant idea, and if it can be used for a much wider class of interventions than they have considered, it will be extremely useful. So I'm suggesting some things. One of the things they say they've got sufficient, one of the sufficient conditions is that you can manipulate collections of variables or specific values where there is at least one single do intervention in each non-response variable. Can we extend that? to when that's not true. Things that I call stochastic manipulations, which assign a new probability distribution of the outcomes of manipulated variables, and what I call functional manipulations, where you do something which is a function of other variables. Um, and can obviously combine the last two there. So I'm going to actually consider an example, which hopefully most of you will know, which is the sprinkler example from Perl got a DAG there, and I apologise, I seem to not be able to count. I've got X1, X2, X3, X4, and X4. I didn't notice that until it was far too late. So what we've got is season of the year, a sprinkler. This is, of course, an American example, so people actually water their lawns. Whether it's raining or not, whether the pavement is wet, of course, Pearl calls this a sidewalk, and whether the pavement is slippery. So we've got some uh, SEMs, structural equation models, and I'm using the methodology from the author's section 6.1, so I'm not interested in it being linear. 
So x1 is a function of noise, x2 is a function of x1 and some noise, etc. And then Perl's first intervention is put the sprinkler on, which essentially removes the edge between x1 and x3. Hence, x3 is no longer a function of x1. Well, I'm going to consider the manipulation. If it is summer, put the sprinkler on. If it is not summer and it is raining, put the sprinkler off. So instead of removing an edge from x1 to x3, we're actually adding an edge x2 to x3 because the sprinkler being on or off depends on both the season and whether it is raining. I've then stated that it's a deterministic relationship, but afterwards I decided it probably wasn't because what happens if it is not summer and it is not raining? We don't know. So in fact, this might not be a deterministic relationship at all, but it's certainly not the kind of a standard sort of intervention of the sort that have been considered in the theorem two. So it's not immediately apparent whether these scenarios actually even satisfy the assumptions stated in the paper, and even if they do, whether or not they, these set of causal predictors will be identifiable. As I've just been given a two-minute warning, I will skip over that. I'm going to skip over that sort of stuff, except for the last little bit. Um, draw attention to the collection of books and papers and causality, which argue that causes are more naturally thought of as events rather than as variables. Um, and there was a paper by Phil in 2000 that's in that list. So going straight on. As befits that discussion paper, this article provides plenty of opportunity for debate, argument, and further research. It is therefore with great pleasure that I propose a vote of thanks to the authors. And I'm just going to put some references up. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great honor and great pleasure to be here and discuss this excellent paper. Um, uh, I'm told that as a seconda I should uh, criticize the paper. I can only do this by being quite uh, pedantic and uh, pointing out some subtleties here and there and how I would phrase this differently because I actually like the paper very much. Uh, it's a simple idea, this uh, idea of um, invariant prediction. Um, and it's been known in various guises in the causal inference literature for a while, but the main idea in the paper, as um, I think Nikolai had the nice graph, is to turn it upside down to say, when we do have data from various uh, different settings, then we identify the, the key determinants, or if you want to call them causes, by looking, searching for this invariant, by trying to make this true. And I think it's probably in the context of big data and having lots of different data sources that um, this now becomes a, a viable idea because we can have data from in different settings. Also interesting is this uh, um, uh, claim that you don't need to know anything about the experimental settings as long as you know that they are experimental settings. Um, so what might be issues here? So um, I'd like to talk a bit about the target of inference. Um, there are lots of examples where we would say that X is the cause of Y, but they do not uh, exhibit invariant prediction. So it's not just that. Um, the assumption one, which is the basic assumption, invariant prediction, uh, in that assumption S star actually depends on the set of the actual experimental settings. So it's not only not unique, it's also it depends on what you happen, the data that you have. And I find that the target of inference should be defined without reference to the data that you happen to have. And in fact, in the presentation, it, was, it sounded much more like you were talking about the parents of Y in the structural equation model, which is something different than what the assumption um, one said here. Also, uh, in the title of the paper and in this uh, assumption, where there's talk about prediction, but I don't, can't really see much prediction in the paper. Um, and there is also, uh, the, in general, uh, structural equation models uh, the paper is very much based on structural equation models. Uh, they make very strong mechanistic assumptions. And the question is, can, we, um, can the method be useful in other situations that are maybe simpler and more realistic than those modeled by structural equation models? So I will attempt, if I have time, to uh, a decision theoretic reformulation of this. Um, so the target of inference, um, the authors kind of first tell us something that doesn't specify a target of inference. They basically say, regardless of 
why, where you're coming from, as long as your problem satisfies this assumption of invariance, then we have this method with the confidence intervals and the uh, sets, etc., that um, we'll find a set that um, uh, is with a confident um, probability of satisfying this assumption. And then they say, they talk about structural equation models and that the parent set uh, satisfies this assumption. But uh, what problems exhibit this assumption, what problems require structural equation model and, and the parent set, that's not so clear. Uh, this is uh, just to remind you, causes, uh, we, we can find that X is a cause of Y without invariance. <laughs> For example, we can find that a causal effect is different in different populations, and that's because uh, covariate distributions will be different. So there is an assumption in the paper that is being violated in those situations, but we still have valid inference about causes of uh, um, effects of causes. And we might also have, in a cause can have an indirect effect via all kinds of intermediate things, and that wouldn't satisfy the um, uh, invariance assumption uh, if you are intervening in the mediating variables. So there's some sort of claim of completeness and direct causes, at least relative to what we have observed here. So I think um, it's good practice to always be clear about the target of inference. And um, I personally like most of all, if you can clearly say what is the decision problem that you want to solve, what is, or what is the ideal experiment that you would want to uh, carry out, and then it is about prediction. It is about prediction for future decisions and for future experiments. And actually, when Peter was talking, he formulated it like this. So it wasn't so clear in the paper. Uh, so as a decision problem, we might want to uh, consider the manipulation of which of a given set of uh, variables that we can manipulate, but not assumed complete or direct in any sense, will be most effective in steering the distribution of a, an interesting outcome Y. We could also ask the other way around which ones would be useless, but that's, I don't know if the method could easily be tweaked into doing the opposite. So the, the guarantee that we get is that what you find are causes, but can we also, can we get the other way around to guarantee that we find the non-causes so we know to omit them? So, and an ideal experiment would be, quite obviously, randomization of all of these. So if, if we had complete freedom, and this is our question, we would just go and randomize all of these variables and find out which ones are the most effective in steering the distribution. So, um, I, as I said, I would like to reformulate this a little bit away from structural equation models. So I'm going to use um, the decision theoretic uh, framework, uh, which goes uh, back to Philip David, that actually has also been used in a very early paper of Judah Pearl, and he just dropped it. So we would have a regime indicator, sigma, or F in some notation. It can uh, distinguish between observational and experimental regimes or different experimental regimes. And what we would want is to basically use the actual experimental settings to make inference about the ideal experimental settings. So our target would be some aspect of the, uh, in an ideal experimental setting of, of the distribution that we see. We might have our response variable, other co uh, the, the covariates that we can intervene on, and other either hidden or observed but non-manipulable variables uh, like this. We would then um, need an assumption which is similar to um, invariance, extended stability with respect to this whole set. So that characterizes the, in, um, the, the experiments that we have. And then we can ask, um, when is the actual data that we have, um, or what actual data and what structure on the hidden variables allow partial identification uh, here. And we can use inference diagrams, which are not causal DAGs, not from uh, structural equation models, to try and answer this. So the invariance, this is in fact almost exactly what was in one of the slides um, earlier on, is the, uh, e uh, the um, equality between conditional distributions under one setting and the other one. And we can write it as a conditional independence. Um, and even though this is not a random variable, so it's almost exactly the same. So we can check these conditional independencies on graphs. Uh, we can look, for example, in this graph, and we see that uh, x3, x4, x5 satisfy uh, the um, uh, invariance property and are minimal um, here. 
So they happen to be the parents in, of y in this setting. Um, this is a setting with a hidden variable where uh, x3 and x4 satisfy this and x, uh, h can actually be ignored. So this is roughly uh, mentioned in proposition four of the authors. Um, and then we have this, and my point here is uh, there's a hidden variable. We have that x2, x4, x5 satisfy the stability, um, and I think the authors would say this is a violation of the assumptions, but I would say not if, you, if, if that's not the question that you want. If what you want is not the parents in a structural equation model, but something that relates to a concrete set of variables that you can manipulate, then this is not wrong. It's just something else that you get. Um, and this is another situation where we could also, I think, extend the um, uh, assumptions uh, that the authors make. And just let me conclude because I'm coming to the end. Um, thank you very much. This is, was a very simulating paper. And I myself have almost convinced myself that um, uh, we can uh, relax some of the assumptions and that we can address uh, very sensible decision problems with this. Um, and so uh, I look forward to working more on this. Thank you very much. And sorry to the others for not being able to stay. Uh, we received uh, four, um, four discussion, uh, for written discussion. I'm not going to read it extensively. It might be a, a bit uh, boring if I do. Uh, I will focus on one topic that uh, is recurrent among this um, uh, discussion. So let me explain. Uh, we start with Peng Ding and Avi Feller from the University of California, Berkeley. They say they have three comments. The two first comments are about um, related uh, literature. So you might want, if, you, if you're interested, uh, please have a look at this discussion and the reply from the authors. But the third point that they make, we found the example of educational attainment interesting, but it's not clear or useful the proposed method is in this setting. We expect the, that all the 13 variables in the example are causally predictive of college graduation. In other words, we imagine the corresponding DAG to be very dense. This setting is common in the social sciences where a truly null relationship between two variables are relatively rare. So that's the common topic I found in the in this discussion. I must say, I forgot to say, I'm really uh, not an expert on this. So that's my quite naive understanding of the reports I'm reading. Uh, next report is from Tyler van der Wiel from Harvard University. And quite similarly, he said something interesting. I would like to challenge the causal discovery community to find a non-trivial application within the social sciences in which we actually learn something new. Okay, so that's, <laughs> that's quite aggressive, but that's, that's an interesting uh, statement. And if I go on, um, even if we accept the applicability of the methodology, the discovery that test scores have a positive causal influence of the probability of obtaining a college degree is hardly surprising, etc., etc. So I guess it's more or less the same uh, topic of that person is not sure that it's uh, still useful in uh, social sciences, but he says that in the genetic example, it's, it's useful. The third uh, report is from Federico Crudu, Freddy Lopez, and Emilio Porco. They are all from Chile, uh, Universidad Católica de Valparaiso and Universidad Federico Santa Maria. And um, so I think they're trying to make the same point. I'm not completely sure because they use this terminology from uh, economist, econometrician with instrumental variable, but I will quote this. Um, one notorious problem for this type of estimation is the strength of the instrument, which is gov um, a weak instrument tends to lead to awkward inferential results. The authors claim that their method is robust to the presence of a weak instrument, but we do not understand how this can happen. Uh, I think that's under, under the statement. I think they, they think it's, this is a big problem. If I understand correctly what they said before. For instance, they say, uh, what if the instrument is irrelevant? Or, what is that is actually endogenous, et cetera, et cetera. Last report we received from Wang Liang Pan and Kan Hong Wen uh, from Sun Yat-sen University. Uh, so they, they congratulate the authors and they make two points. One about, um, they ask whether this result could still uh, be established in high dimensional and ultra high dimensional setups. And uh, they, they ask uh, several questions in, in this respect. So, 
And the second question they have is, seems to be related to the predictors. They, they have some numerical study and they, which seems to indicate that the method might not work so well when the correlation between uh, the predictors that are causal or are not becomes quite strong. So, anyway, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank the authors for making invariance a central and up upfront concept that you need in causal inference. And I say that because I consider that the, the really fundamental problem of causal inference is that you cannot define what the intervention is, at least not in non-causal terms. We are a bit sometimes like that Supreme Court justice that once had to define what obscenity was and the best you could do was saying, I know it and I see it. So sometimes you like our interventions in our system to be self-evident but that's not always the case. And what I'd like to discuss here is how the ideas introduced by Peters and, co and his co-authors will help to disentangle some issues of measurement. Because the notion of invariances are useful not only to understand causality better, but also sometimes understand what measurement and measurement error are. So to give this through a way of an example, let's say we'd like to find the cause effect of gross national product on democratization levels of a nation. And the issue here is that you can, it's not hard to think of ways of changing the gross national product of a country. The difficulty is we have way too many ways of doing that. It's not very clear whether there is one way which will keep an invariance relationship between GNP and democratization level. So how can you start to approach a problem like this? Well, we can do this by introducing some extra layers of model in there thinking, for example, in this classic uh, study from Ken Bolling, the SEM literature, where you're actually trying to relate industrialization levels of a country against its democratization levels. And GNP here just boils down to one particular measurement of this concept, which of course by itself is not easy to precisely pinpoint what it means physically in the real world. But you might think that as you throw interventions in the system, there'll be some invariances that remain there. For example, invariances of measurement. And you can start to think through on what these latent traits here would mean in terms of uh, variables that work as if they were mediators that preserve invariance of measurement under different interventions. And the concepts that were developed here can be carried over to these ideas and try to define what exactly it is that you're measuring. And we can link this to this wealth of literature on measurement error problems. When you have, for example, regression problems that are called variance a measured error. There is much there uh, on discussing how you could estimate these models, how you could post, pose some assumptions in structure so you can identify parameters and test some constraints that can falsify these models. But the, what happens here is this is not really done from a causal framework. And you can try to see what happens when you try to have estimation of cause effects there. For example, boring ideas where some of these measurements are treated as causes of the latent constructs, which allow you to maybe identify some cause effects or reject the possibility of a measure confounding. And you can go further away and link this to recent advances on identifying non-parametric latent variable models, where you'd be able to identify these condition distributions of measurements given hidden variables and see what would happen under particular intervention where some marginal distributions will change by some of the condition distributions would remain. This gives you a venue by which you could test some of these invariants without requiring parametric assumptions. And this can be external, for example, even in the case where you have perfect measurements of treatment and outcome, but not, of course, for confounders. So you can't just use straight away standard adjustment formulas, but you can link this to possible interventions that will try uh, to compensate for imperfect um, modifications of the system. For example, you can try to link how imperfect intervention could be identified by see whether some sort of negative control would keep its properties even under a change of environment. Even where this change of environment also affect possible confounders between treatment and outcome. So uh, I would like again to thank the authors for these stimulating ideas and I'd like to point out they also affect the statistical community at large, including communities such as measurement error uh, estimation. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Philip David, retired. Uh, 
fascinating paper. Thanks very much to the authors. Uh, very impressive. Um, I've just got some scribbles here, and uh, in the good old days, the society uh, would prepare a nice transcript of uh, these impromptu comments. I don't know if that still happens. I very much hope so, because otherwise I won't know what I've said. So, <laughs> anyway, I, let me point you at figure one of the galley. That's what I'm going to talk about. So there's an, the, the figure one is based on the idea that there's an underlying structural equation model. But in fact, that won't be the, we won't know that. And we certainly won't know that the picture which is in front of us is the right picture. Um, so let me suppose that we have data from regimes A and B in figure one. So we have five variables, Y is the one we care about, and four Xs. Um, and that's all we know, really. But we have got two regimes, one purely observational, which is uh, in figure A, and another one where we've intervened on X2 and X3, that's figure B. That's all we know, except we, we've seen what happens to the other variables. And we note that there is some invariance across those two regimes, uh, that indeed the distribution in both regimes, the distribution of Y given X2 and X4 is the same. We should also note that the distribution of Y in both regimes given only x2 and x5 is the same, ignoring, or given x2 and x4 and x5. So there, we, and we don't know that x, in any sense x5 precedes x4. So there's nothing, so there's nothing to choose between x, saying x2 and x5 is the s star we want, or x2 and x4 is the s star we want. So s star is not unique in that case. Now, it, it becomes unique if we add um, the third picture, C, and then it has to be X2 and X4. But, uh, so, I'm thinking what Vanessa said about what we have and what we would like. We might have A and B. We might like to predict for C. Um, now, it turns out that in, if we knew that, that, was the, that these were all the right pictures, that X2 and X4 would be the right things to condition on and X2 and X5 will be wrong. But we don't know that's the right story. And indeed, it might not be. And there's nothing to say that uh, one is better than the other. So I, I think what I'm trying to say is that the idea that there is a unique S star, uh, which we can sort of pull out, which is the set of causal predictors, is just, is just not the case. And indeed, without knowing anything about what's going on, there's no reason to think that any thing which is invariant between A and B will continue to be invariant when we intervene in a different way as in C. So, we, so uh, unless we make some very, very strong assumptions, and when are we justified in making those assumptions? I'm not sure. Anyway, I said it was going to be scrappy. My notes are scrappy. There will be a very clear uh, uh, document coming out of the society for me to make even clearer, I hope. Uh, and when that is ready, I will pass it on to the authors for their comments. Thank you very much. Uh, again, I thank you very much for uh, the fan fantastic and very inspiring paper, which I think will be will be a lot of things that will come out of that in the future. I'm looking forward to seeing what that is. Uh, my comment is going to be uh, a scrappy, <laughs> but <laughs> but on the overheads, I just made them on the train over here. Uh, <coughs> the uh, and I would just talk about limits on environment. So essentially what I'm saying is very close to Vanessa's comments, saying that um, there is actually a formal, it could be practical once you are starting to thinking in this way to have a, a systematic formalism for what an environment is. And I'm sort of suggesting that this idea of the limits uh, actually could actually provide such a one and maybe could be useful. Uh, and I think it was slightly incorrect when um, Vanessa talked about influence diagrams because they're not standard influence diagrams, they're limited memory influence diagrams, uh, which essentially includes the hammers uh, in the picture, uh, also what we, we see. In the standard classic one, you have chance notes, you have decision notes, and then you have utilities. We don't care about them because that's not our, our, our problem at the moment. But every and then you have policies and strategies, so you actually have ways in which these hammers can be hammers, uh, and that is essentially defined by a, uh, something there which really are the parents, you have policies, and you have a strategy. I think the strategy here was sigma on Vanessa's um, 
overhead. And the point is that, so what you really do is you put in the, these are the hammers. They're not as pretty as the hammers that we saw before, but they have the same role. And this is, now we start hammering things. Uh, <coughs> and this gives a, 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 a very small class of, if you like, atomic or specific manipulation hammers uh, and, that, and that you can look up, these are really, uh, but you could also make more complex ones by uh, letting them depend on other variables in various ways. So in a certain sense, these are defining various types of environments. So a strategy in the decision theoretic, uh, in the limit formalism is really exactly the same as an environment for what you call uh, for one of these experiments. And what I, and generally, this is the formula for the joint distribution of the chance and environment node. So you have ways in which you manipulate, uh, you have ways in which every of the nodes of the chance nodes depend on its parents, including the hammers as parents. And you have ways in which uh, the um, decisions themselves or the hammering depends on their parents again. If this has to be true no matter, has, has to make sense no matter what the X picture looks like, uh, you probably need to have no only decision nodes uh, sitting uh, there, uh, only hammers being parents of hammers. But that's another story. And I just wonder whether you could formalize this notion for maybe you could actually design causal experiments. You could talk about what's the most optimal way of, of causal experiments. Make you so it was a sufficient type of experiments would be a complete set. And um, if you actually now happen to observe these environment variables, would it always, I think I understand in your case that you would divide the material into bits. And I presume you would always want to condition on this. And, and it could also be partially unknown, uh, which would then correspond to hidden variables. But I suggest that you take this environment concept, idea that you have, and make a very formal description of what it is, and then think about optimizing experiments and such things. Don. Yeah, so it's a very interesting paper. I've just uh, been writing my essay about it. Um, so my kind of question is, could you apply uh, invariant prediction to functional data? What would that look like? Um, so I'm just going to sort of give an example of how th this could actually work. Um, would anything actually be different? I think my take home message is going to be, no, it's not very different. Um, so I'm taking an example from Linfist. Um, suppose we measure um, brain activity in two different regions, maybe left brain and right brain. Um, so these are some pieces of functional data. Um, that's data which depends continuously on time. And then we've got some kind of SEM um, which predicts a subject's response. So your subject's lying there, and then you ask them, I don't know, how much pain were you feeling? And then they report that back to you on a continuous scale. Um, okay, so we need some environments for this whole thing to work out. Um, so I'm introducing some indicator variable. This could be the the actual stimulation you put onto your subject, right? If they're, you know, their fingers in a jar, it's either hot water or warm water, I don't know. So that's gonna give us two environments. And now the question is, of x1 and x2, which is a, a causal functional variable? Um, so obviously in my diagram it's x2. Um, so just quickly, what, what model is actually implicit here? So I'm assuming um, a linear model, but now everything becomes an integral, right? Um, so you've got, this is just sort of implicit from my structural equation model. And we've got this epsilon, which perhaps is, is Gaussian or something like that. Um, but now, if we just define a clever inner product, we get back to something which is sort of just a normal model, um, a normal linear model. And here's sort of the important point. It's actually going to hold in those two different environments. So the assumptions that we see in the paper can sort of continue to work even though the things we're looking at now are functions. Um, and the other sort of critical point um, is that these noise variables, their distribution would be the same under the two different environments. So nothing really has changed here except we've got angular brackets and um, everything else is, is normal. And now just to talk practically, Suppose we wanted to actually do invariant prediction. Um, if we look at 
maybe a concrete proposal like method two, which was outlined. Um, we've got scalar residuals, so actually we can just apply exactly the same kind of algorithm, which might look something like this. So what would be different in a functional case? Well, as at line two, that's going to be now finding a, fitting a functional model. So we might have to expand our data on a Fourier basis, but everything's kind of the same. And then in line three, we've just got some um, we've just got some scalars that we need to test. And the approximation we're making is is kind of just the same as the approximation that's made in the original approximate test, just that gamma hat is is close to gamma. Um, and then you kind of just take the intersection. So roughly speaking, everything remains the same. And just in the last couple of minutes, what what would happen if the response was also a function? So I so I've cleverly made the response scalar, so then we just had scalar residuals and everything looked the same. Um, so if it, was, if it was a function, what we'd have to do is test the equality of distributions of two functions. Um, so actually that's something which we do know about. Um, again, we perhaps could use a basis expansion method. Um, so we'd sort of extract the first k components so under our null hypothesis, they would actually all have the same distribution. Then we could test those, and then we would sort of have a test if we used some correction. We'd have a test at the right level. Obviously, if we left out an important component, it might not be a very powerful test. But it, in theory, I think we could just do kind of the same thing here, but then where our residuals are, our whole function. There's, there's a reference to the Lynn Fitz paper. Um, you probably know that reference, but yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. First of all, thanks a lot. Uh, a lot of interesting comments. So I made some notes. Uh, definitely, I don't know about you, so I can't answer all of the questions. A lot of uh, interesting uh, food for thoughts. So maybe um, just two points from my side now. So the first one regarding the first speaker, thanks a lot. So uh, there was the question about um, what kind of interventions do we assume? And so there, just let me try to stress again. So uh, the framework really doesn't specify what kind of interventions um, we are working with. So we are saying we are given the data from different environments. Um, the only time when we have to specify what kind of interventions we are talking about is when we are looking for the sufficient conditions for identifiability. So whenever we want to say, so we had this, uh, this uh, set S of E, and whenever we were investigating, okay, when does this equal the set S star, then we somewhat have to specify what they are the environments. So we didn't know any better way of just writing down the uh, type of interventions that we knew about and then proved identifiability as a mathematical result. So you mentioned the sort of in a different type of intervention like adding an edge. And I think this is a good comment. I would be surprised if uh, you, you didn't get a very similar results. So I think this is an interesting intervention that one can also look at. I think we, we don't in the paper, but I think it's, it, it, this, I'm confident that it should be possible. Um, so maybe a second comment. So now, um, this was raised both, I think, by Phil David and also by you, Vanessa, the, uh, so the uh, target of inference. I think this is a very good point, a very valid point. So mathematically, how do we deal with this? Um, so in the assumption one, they really say the assumption says there exists a set S star such that invariant prediction holds. And now uh, you're totally right, this is not unique. And then you are, I mean, you, you pointed out um, a little bit the figure one, and the question is now what is the uh, sort of the correct target? So you said correctly the S star would be possible if you just look at A and B, um, either choosing two or two and four or two, four and five, for example, would be possible. So now maybe uh, two comments on this, and uh, maybe this is a bit of a provocation, I don't know. So. It, the first one is, if you consider the set S of E, then it's, the, it's unique in this case, right? So the set S of E is always the variable two. So now it, it's the intersection of all the uh, possibilities, right? So now the question is, is this an interesting target or not? Because it depends on the environments. And then, so maybe as a food uh, of thought uh, from my side, I wouldn't say that this is, uh, this is necessarily bad. Because whenever we are talking about causal effects, often we 
speak about them in relation to a set of variables, right? So uh, smoking is causing lung cancer if you don't measure a variable in between, like, I don't know, the tar and the lung. But if you have something in between, then, for example, the concept of a direct cause might change. And I think it could be possible that uh, you have a similar thing for environments. So whenever these set of environments change, maybe this is also, a, maybe it's a good thing that then the, the identifiable set of um, causal predictors, this S of E changes. Because whenever you have, for example, a variable in between that you cannot intervene on anyhow, so then why do we want this as, uh, as being a true cause? Uh, at all. So, but this is, I mean, something we don't discuss in the paper, but I would be interested in, in looking at in a bit more detail. Okay, I think. Yeah, maybe I can make a few, a few comments. Just uh, in relation to the first one is really the case with the interventions you showed kind of for the, for the Pearl example that the coverage statement is still true, right? So, we still have the, the probability that S hat is um, a subset of, of S star with high probability that is still guaranteed under any type of intervention. Um, then there are a few more. Uh, so the one, the, the comment about the lack of prediction, that kind of hurt a bit. Um, because for me, it was really the way I came into that was really moved from applied problems where the prediction was really the starting point where you wanted to have a model which is going to work under different assumptions for example in environmental applications where the predictions you're going to get are true even if you change a lot the predictor variables you have and that the prediction you have is actually valid under all types of interventions you have which naturally of course leads to a causal model and I think the way here is is to, to translate it into a decision problem which um, Stefan mentioned as well I mean if you want to look at the intervention which will have the largest impact you can look at the confidence intervals for example for gammas which are going to tell you what is going to happen if I change the variables uh, and from these you can derive lower and upper bounds on the change you can expect on average if you really make an, an intervention and based on that of course you can, can arrive where is a good target where I can make an intervention because I'm guaranteed in this case if I have a, a confidence interval found away from zero I have a guarantee the change is going to be at least that much. Um, but I should say, yeah, I mean, all these comments were really interesting. Um, and maybe the one I can also expand a bit on is the one raised in the written comment about the application to social science, where I know they they don't like the sparsity assumption a bit inherent in here, right? They, where you say you have a graph and actually just some of these edges exist, where you say, uh, where social scientists would say, actually, the graph is dense. You have an edge from every node kind of to every other node. And I think definitely, I mean, the sparsity assumption is a, um, can be criticized for that, but actually you don't need it here because you can still just work with the confidence intervals you get for gamma. So you don't have to just work with the set S hat we get for the predictors. You can just say the object of interest is actually the gamma itself and then you get confidence intervals for that and there's no reason you should expect sparsity. And I think, I mean, there are a lot more interesting comments, but um, in the interest of time, maybe I, I don't know if you want to say something or no. So I appreciate it very much, all the comments which have been made, and maybe I should add one more perspective, in essentially already what Iona said. So the target is this SE, and it's the non-uniqueness of this S star. And so our construction was to just build the intersection of all these uh, possible S stars. And I'm not sure whether this is actually an, some sort of an optimal construction. But what this approach somehow uh, emphasizes a lot, it, this is a story uh, to a guard against false positive selections. So this is somehow a driving factor of this whole thing. And so if you build this intersection, this might be very conservative, but at least uh, it 
is a guard against false positives and somehow driven by the applications which we showed a bit in, in these gene perturbation experiments, uh, that's maybe a good thing to do to guard against false positives. What you could also see is actually the outcome is rather limited and poor. We don't find very much, but actually what we find seems kind of interesting at least. I find also the limits uh, <laughs> uh, comment very interesting. I, I uh, we need to look a bit more into that, but I think this is a very inspiring concept. And in general, I enjoyed very much uh, being here, uh, listening to your thoughts, and uh, thank you very much.